Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The microphones are on, the cameras are rolling, and this is the regularly scheduled City Council meeting of the City of Geneva. It is Monday, the eve of Swedish Days, our seventh decade of celebrating that festival in Geneva. Isn't that something? This year's food is from 1949, so it's going to be exciting. Just a little bout of history there. We begin with the roll call. Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Bruno. Here. Uh, Burkhard. Here, my vote. Clements. Here. Ruby. Here. Caven. Here. Kilberg. Here. Maladra. Here. Marks. Here. McGowan. Here. Swanson. Here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Alderman Tara Burkhardt is joining us by telephone. Her participation by telephone is permitted under Illinois statute. So when Tara is called on to either ask a question or cast a vote, she will be asked to state her name and then cast that vote accordingly. We will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I would like to ask, hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm going to ask uh, our, our two new friends in the city of Geneva, uh, Mr. Buck and Mr. Baker, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Whenever you're ready, gentlemen. How's that going? Thank you, gentlemen. We get to begin our meeting tonight with uh, introductions of some new professional staff members, and it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium uh, Mr. Cedric Baker. Mr. Baker, come on up, sir. This is the best part, because after this, you guys get to leave, man. How are you, sir? I am well, Mr. Mayor. Good to see you. Uh, Mr. Baker's an electric lineman with the city, and I've got a little bio here on you. Your nickname is Bear. That's correct, sir. Now, why is that? <laughs> My mother nicknamed me that, sir. Your mother nicknamed is that right? Yes. For any particular reason, or were you a troubled kid? Did you have a hard <laughs> time behaving? What was the scoop? Uh, no, my father is a um, professor. He's a minister. Uh -huh. He teaches theology at the University of Chicago. No kidding. Yes. He's retired now, though. My mother is a psychologist. Ha, <laughs> that explains it right there. <laughs> You've answered the question. Okay. As a younger man, you used to race motorcycles. Yes, sir, that's correct. Where did you race motorcycles? Uh, I did a lot in Illinois and also a lot in Florida. Is that right? Yeah. What brand? Honda. Honda. You started out as a meter reader for ComEd. That is all correct. You have been blessed to be an IBEW trained journeyman lineman and has worked in the industry for 20 years. Uh, just under 20 years. Wow. That is correct. Now, this is according to you. Quote, Mr. Baker says that everyone has been very helpful answering all his questions. That is correct. They've been... Uh, you haven't met the council yet, have you? <laughs> you haven't? Uh, I still think that they're great people. <laughs> good. You have also witnessed a very good attitude concerning safety. Yes, uh, I think you know, I've been in um, the electrical industry just only 20 years, and unfortunately in, in this industry, uh, you see a lot of bad accidents. Sure. And uh, here at Geneva, I've seen you know guys go the extra mile for safety, and that makes me feel real good. That's fantastic. Now, I left out something very important. Uh, you and I had a brief chance to visit beforehand. But according to your bio, Mr. Baker, you served in the United States Marine from 1984 to 1991 and were honorably discharged. That's correct, sir. Thank you for your service. Thank you. And you shared with me that your son is currently deployed. That's correct. And your son is deployed where we all hope our children and friends and family would not be deployed. Unfortunately, that is correct, sir. He is safe? He is safe. He is doing well? To the best of my knowledge. <laughs> and. It's time for you to brag now. Your son is going to go to law school. That's correct. And he's thinking of a couple places that, as far as I know, are so-so. Yeah. Stanford? Stanford uh, University Chicago? of Chicago. Uh, he's been contemplating Northwestern as well. <laughs> Safety. <laughs> 
And this is, of course, attributed to you. This is um, Papa Bear doing well. <laughs> well, um, all I can say is I don't raise failures. <laughs> well said. Well said. Well, we're delighted you're with us. Anything else you'd like to share with us or the council? We've got millions of people tuning in tonight as well, you know. Well, I consider it an honor and a blessing to be a part of the Geneva Electrical Team and looking forward to spend many, many years here. We're delighted to have you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, any questions or comments from Mr. Baker? Alderman Kilbert. Uh, welcome to Geneva. I know you have a skill set that's very much in demand, and uh, we're glad that you joined our team here in Geneva. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Buck, your turn, sir. Kyle Buck, ladies and gentlemen. Now, this, this, is, this is cool. You're a graduate of the first class of St. Charles North. Yes. Wow. I did all four years. Yes, sir. You did. All, that's good. Yeah. You did, all, <laughs> did it take you four years? Yes. Yeah. That's good news, man. Now, check this out, folks. Moved from Nova Scotia, Canada to the United States in 1999. Mm -hmm. November 99, yep. Hmm. Went to line school in Boise, Idaho. Yes, sir. Did line work for the Portland, Seattle area, then came back to Illinois to work for the city of Rochelle. Mm -hmm. And what is the nickname of Rochelle? The Hub. Very good. Why is that? Because of all the trains. Well done, <laughs> man. What's your favorite part of Rochelle? Not the trains. Not the trains. <laughs> <laughs> that now, was a good community. It People is a lovely good, community, yeah. isn't it? It was, yeah. Mr. Baker, check this out. Mr. Buck likes to ride motorcycles. Now, you ride them, but Mr. Baker races them. What's yeah, the difference? I never, I never race motorcycles. Cars, but not motorcycles. So, What kind of motorcycle do you ride? I got a Harley. You got a Harley? Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that convenient? Yeah. <laughs> you know who else is a Harley in your department? Hal and That's him. That's right. And our mechanic, too. Oh, yeah? It's a popular choice of vehicle. So. Clearly it is, man. Recently participated in the APPA's Light Up Navajo initiative to bring electric services to homes in the Navajo Nation that had never had electric power before. Yes, sir. Do you share a little bit about that with us? Um, yeah, so we went out there. Uh, we were out there for a month total. Wow. Um, took one day off in 33 days, so it was, it was definitely an experience, but it was eye-opening at the same time to actually see. A lot of people here are like, oh, why, is the, why are you spending money and going out there and doing that? Sure. You know, when you have people in your own country that don't have power mm -hmm. and how humbling it is to actually see that when you turn their light bulb on for the first time, they, they're 80 years old, kids never had power, they don't have running water, nothing like that. Wow. It, it was a cool experience, that's for sure. It's a different world out there. Indeed. Mm -hmm. That's really neat. Yeah. Now, this is pretty cool. Your father's been a lineman for 30 years. Mm -hmm. 32, actually. 32? 32. For the city of, I don't know how to pronounce this, is it St. Charles? <laughs> He's been there since 2003. St. Charles is, of course. But, yes. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. Is your dad tuning in tonight? I don't know. I don't think so, but maybe. If he knows there's a YouTube video of it, I'm sure he'll watch it. Oh, I'm sure he will. We'll make sure he gets one. <laughs> so, uh, now you said to me earlier that uh, your wife is a nurse? Fiance. Fiance is a nurse, mm -hmm. and you have a little one as well? Yes. So you need to sneak out of here, too, and, and tend to the little one? Mm-hmm. Because uh, your fiance needs to report to work. Yes, sir. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So we're going to keep you here as long as possible. <laughs> you should have brought them in. Yeah, well, I didn't know. I didn't know we could do that. But well, what the heck, man? Yeah. See, the attorney's here. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions or comments for for the council? <laughs> for Mr. Buck. <clears throat> Alderman Kilbert. Likewise, uh, you have a skill set that's in demand. Uh, and uh, we're, we're certainly glad to have you in Geneva. Welcome, and good luck to you. Thank Be you. safe. I appreciate the opportunity, Be safe. guys. Thank you. Now, you guys are aware of uh, Mr. Baker, Mr. Buck. You're aware of Swedish Days coming up? Oh, yes. yes. His first experience with the big festival in the three But you've, you've been before. I've been before, yes. Yeah, good Lord. First experience, Mr. Baker. <laughs> it's exciting. <laughs> Never forget the first time. <laughs> Swedish days. God help us. Welcome aboard, sir. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, item 3B, as in boy, is the Mill Race Redevelopment Charette Preview. We have a very special guest with us this evening who's going to lead us through this preview. We welcome you back, sir, to City Hall, and thanks for being with us. Thank you. Good evening. Oh, from the beginning. Good evening, Mayor Burns and older men and women. Rick Hitchcock, Hitchcock Design Group. And a week from today, week, week from right now, it's showtime. Um, you, 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 you just, you're a tough act to follow. That, that, those were two very... Aren't those great guys? Uh, very energetic uh, presentation. They left because they heard you were next. <laughs> <laughs> that thrilling, yes. Yeah. Uh, we are, of course, uh, delighted that we are, have been engaged uh, by the city and by the uh, Shodin Family Foundation to conduct uh, both the charrette and the entitlement process that follows it. Uh, David DeGroote uh, asked that I give a little discussion tonight about really what is the charrette with a name like that. Everyone's wondering what in the world it is. It sounds like it might be a bathroom tissue or something, but it isn't. Uh, the, uh, the site, of course, is the 1.8 acre site um, at the southwest corner of, uh, of 25 and 38. And this is just a little, we, uh, it was originally coined a training exercise, and we're really not training anybody to do anything. This is really just a preview of what the event is. So here's what we're going to talk about. Uh, the purpose, why are we doing it? who is involved, what the process looks like, uh, the charrette in particular, and then what some outcomes are. And so here's the beginning, which is two purposes really, both terrifically important. One is to produce a consensus redevelopment strategy. Uh, consensus being key word and redevelopment strategy, the other key phrase. Uh, so many of us have been involved in planning all of our lives, and we tend to think of plans as something that's written on a piece of paper or drawn on a piece of paper. This distinguishes from this, is distinguished from a plan in that it is a more of a complete thought. It involves not only what might be on the paper, but all kinds of components, some of which are arrayed around the perimeter there, uh, everything from policy to infrastructure and eventually some buildings we, we trust. And so it's to produce a consensus strategy. Uh, the idea being is that there is uh, something that we all feel very strongly about. And the second piece, which is really crucial and very distinctive in this circumstance, is that the intent is to construct something. Now, in this particular circumstance, the developer will be largely responsible for doing the constructing. But in many uh, charrette or in many planning circumstances, the outcome is a plan which leads to policies and some resource deployment. Uh, in this case, the, the intention is to get something constructed. We put the three-dimensional question marks on there because we don't know what that is yet, but that's part of the process is to figure out what all of that is. And it's something that we trust will be genuinely sustainable, potentially catalytic, and it will involve uses, connections, uh, image, and value. So all of those things go into that process. Why charrette? This is, this is uh, something that I think you would ask me last time I was at the podium. And it really is because it compresses the time that it takes to get from the beginning of the process to the end. It is intended to help focus our experts Everybody has busy schedules, and so we get our team together. We get them, I want to say locked in the room. They're not locked in, but they're intended to be there for four straight days. So they are focused. It engages our stakeholders, and there's a lot of them. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it engages them in a very short period of time. Everybody has, again, terrifically busy schedules, and to get people to come in and out and in and out of a process really is very hard to do anymore these days. You know what it takes to get everybody together. And uh, to get all the stakeholders focused is tough. It's really important because it's a forum that we can share our values that will emerge across the course of four days. But it is crucial because it's part of how we create our own report card and report back to you on how we're doing. 
is we want to make sure that we build a foundation with shared values. And this last one, I almost took it off and then I left it on. It, it is really important that we, that, that, that the process helps to facilitate consensus, although to be sure, consensus is a byproduct of any entitlement process because presumably you all reach an agreement on something. But it facilitates it by, again, compressing the time period across which you need to develop that consensus. And so it is, uh, by, by compressing the time, it just puts everybody in kind of a heightened state of awareness and focus. And the intent is, is to move uh, quickly and efficiently through the process. Who charrettes? Uh, the consultant team is at the core of this. That kind of, yeah, the, this got stretched out. It's, it's round on my screen, but it kind of got smooshed on your screen. Uh, the consultant team, the dark blue at the center, uh, Hitchcock Design Group, Business Districts, Inc., Fitzgerald, and WBK, we are involved in the process. Well, we've been planning for it for some time. We will be involved every minute of the, of the four days starting Monday of next week. Uh, a little bit about each of the teams. Uh, Hitchcock Design Group, we have done work for the city of Geneva. We're proud of the work that we did on the Geneva streetscape many years ago. Uh, we have also done some other work in town. Um, we have never done any work for the co-sponsor for Shodeen, so this is the first time for us working uh, with them. Uh, Business Districts, Inc., um, I believe that they have done some work in town, although I must confess to you I don't know precisely what it is at this point, but I think uh, uh, Bridget has done work here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I should mention, uh, on the Hitchcock Design Group team, it'll be me, it will be my colleague Lance Tees, our project manager Dan Kim, and some others from time to time. Deidre Ewers, our communication specialist, has been involved so, so far. Business Districts, Inc. is Bridget Lane and Diane uh, Williams. Uh, we, Bridget and I have worked together for years, decades really, if we must confess, and uh, her expertise is uh, market economics and that is precisely what she's doing in this case. And her colleague's expertise uh, is conveniently historic preservation, so they're a dynamite one-two team on this. And so we're delighted they're on the team. Uh, Fitzgerald Associates Architects are wonderful uh, architects uh, with offices in Chicago. They do a great deal of residential and mixed use work both in the city of Chicago and in the suburbs. Uh, we're working with Mike Brecklaw and his colleagues. Uh, Mike is uh, an extremely thoughtful and skillful architect and we're thrilled that he's part of the team. And lastly, WBK. You, many of you know them. They are just up the riverways in St. Charles. Uh, Willsburg Kelsey is what they formerly went by. John Wills is our contact there. And they are providing all of the transportation, stormwater management, and infrastructure engineering. And they are likewise are a crucial team member. We have worked in the past with them. And we've actually done charrettes with them in the past. So we have a lot of familiarity with them. We've worked for years with the folks with Fitzgerald. And so we all know each other uh, very well and respect each other a great deal. Uh, local team, which is that next ring, a little bit lighter blue. Uh, of course, these are uh, folks you all know, David DeGroote and Kathleen Timoshenko from uh, your staff, and Dave Patzelt representing the Shodin Family Foundation. And they have been meeting with us on a regular basis for about two months as we get prepared for the charrette. And we just had a meeting this afternoon at 4 o'clock. And all of our meetings run about twice as long as we think they ought to because we have so much material that we're covering. They have been uh, terrific, absolutely terrific. Um, then the next ring around that is we have a group of, there's not a great term for this, but we're calling them primary stakeholders. They're the folks who maybe are on the front line of the stakeholder interests. Uh, lots of regulatory folks, whether it's IDOT, DNR, uh, certainly city interests, maybe county interests in some cases, neighbors, uh, t tenants, uh, 
folks who are really active in the community, people that we just felt like we really needed to reach out to and have some one-on-one -on -one conversations with. And then last and hardly least, all of the other stakeholders around the outside, folks who simply have an interest in uh, the community or the downtown residents, uh, maybe potential tenants have an interest, uh, just anyone who has an interest in the property and its redevelopment, uh, they're part of that. So that was kind of a windy discussion about who, but that is who will be participating in one form or another next week. It's really hard to illustrate exactly what this charrette looks like except we did our best here, which is to say, in the period leading up to uh, the charrette itself, we have been gathering a host of information, frankly, so much that it's kind of it's buried us, uh, learning about the marketplace, learning about all of the various uh, physical and natural resources, uh, learning all about the stakeholders in the area, uh, you all know that we have a survey that's been online for some time now. We have well over 600 responses, which is sensational. Uh, it gives it statistical uh, validity, and we know that people are paying attention, which is great. We take all of that information, and the intent is to show it like in a uh, sort of in a vortex, We're getting crushed into this small space, which is one week between the 24, actually four days, between the 24th and 27th. And that all happens intentionally before July, it happens after Swedish days and before uh, July 1st because we wanted to make sure that we captured people before they escaped into vacation land and uh, knew we had to get that done before the 1st of July. After we get through the charrette process, we will have a couple of months, it's hard to be precise about this. This may dribble into October and November, but we have several months where we'll go back through the traditional entitlement process armed with this consensus strategy so that we can make, we can confidently make, uh, we hope, rapid progress with the site design, the architecture, the engineering, the landscape architecture, and the development agreement that bundles all of that together. And then sometime in the fall, October might be putting too precise a point on it, but sometime after that, uh, hopefully the project will be entitled and the uh, developer will be off to the races uh, with implementing um, what has been determined. Where in the world did this term, the sh charrette, come from? Uh, it is apparently French for the word cart. I'm not a student of French, um, but I'll take their word for it. Where, the, where it came from, though, is architects uh, in the 19th century, they were, being, they were in training, they were going through these crash courses, very intense, immersive learning, they're brainstorming ideas, and then at a certain time, this cart would be wheeled through between the desks, they would have to load their work onto the cart, Pencils down, time is up, you've got to show what you've got. And so it was always, the, the, the term has come to represent this intense workshop or series of workshops where we go through the process in a very focused, very intensive way. And we have to put our pencils down at certain times because we have to report out on Wednesday evening how we're doing and then we report out again on uh, Thursday evening how we're doing. So we will we'll have uh, no shortage of stress during that uh, period of time. But again, it's immersive learning for all the participants, not only the consultant team, but all of the folks who will be listening, uh, coming to the sessions. We will be brainstorming a lot. We'll be receiving feedback pretty much continuously uh, from each other, from our local team, from the primary and, and all of the other stakeholders. We'll be refining those strategies and we'll be reporting out on our preferences. And here's what it looks like in a nutshell. On Monday morning, we're gonna start, actually we're gonna start a little bit before this. Uh, Dave Patzold has arranged for us to be uh, camping pretty much continuously over at uh, Riverside, back to the, Riverside is the, uh, the banquet facilities over there. 
I will tell you in 40 years of doing what I've been doing, we've done a lot of charrettes. We have never had an accommodation quite as sensational as this because not only is it on the river, but from our space, we can look directly at the site. So it is pretty deluxe, I will tell you. We're going to start at 8 o'clock with a briefing with the local team. We're going to start right in at 9, interviewing uh, stakeholders in confidential interviews. Uh, we have invited a great many stakeholders. We're going to have, in some cases, four discussions going on at a time. Uh, 7 o'clock, we're going to facilitate a workshop in that space where we're going to uh, present our resource market and stakeholder facts. You'll recall those were those circles on that other slide. So we just want to have a common understanding with everybody. This is what we know to be factual. And if we hear something where someone disputes some of the facts, we'll certainly welcome that and, and, and drill down and try to understand if we can get the, the right facts on the table. That's crucial. We're going to talk about the participant performance expectations. That's kind of a fancy way of saying creating our report card so that we know how to grade ourselves as we go along. What, are, what, what constitutes an, uh, a successful outcome? What are the values that we share so that we know how we're doing as we go along? We're going to talk a little bit about some image preferences. That won't take a great deal of time. We're going to review the remaining schedule, and we're going to announce to the public that we're going to have an open house on uh, Wednesday evening at, uh, I think it starts at 5, and i got to look at my notes here in a second. Anyway, so that's everything that we do on Monday. Tuesday is kind of our work day. We start every day with a briefing of the local team. We review what happened the night before. If we've got some holes we need to plug up or some information that we're, that's a little weak that we need to shore up, we'll get that figured out. We're going to have what we're calling an open studio uh, at 9 o'clock. Uh, till 11 o'clock in case we have any straggling interviews or if there's some folks who say, gosh, you know, I, I wasn't signed up for an interview, but I really want to talk to you. I've got some concerns or I've got some issues or I've got some insight that I want to share with you. Uh, we're going to take those, we're going to call them pop-ups for lack of a better term. They're unscheduled. We'll take those from 9 to 11. Then we're back at it, uh, brainstorming alternatives. Um, and then at 4 o'clock, we're going to brief the local team and winnow down. My sense is we'll have stuff plastered all over the room. We're going to try to cull it down to some things that we think are the strongest candidate opportunities to carry forward. And then we're going to go get some rest. On Wednesday, we're back at it. It's going to be another long day. Uh, we're going to start by working on uh, Actually, we'll have a little briefing in the morning, but we'll advance the preferences right off the bat. We'll be uh, talking to the local team at 3 o'clock, which is middle of the afternoon, and the reason is because at 4, we want to give a little uh, uh, kind of a sneak preview to some key stakeholders. Uh, it might very well be some of you. Uh, at 5 o'clock, we start the open house, which is just what it means. It's We're going to have information in the room. We'll have people manning the, the stations, if you will. Uh, public can come in whenever they wish, anytime they wish, get one-on-one -on -one time with us. We'll have a presentation at 6.30, and we'll do an encore at 7.30. Uh, and then at 8.30, after lights are out, we'll uh, do a little debrief with the team and see what we've learned, just share some insights. That will be a long day not to be outdone by Thursday, which will be another long day. We're going to refine a preferred concept. At 3 o'clock, we're going to kind of do a dry run of the presentation with the local team and debug it. Just make sure that uh, everybody's really comfortable with what we're taking to the public. And at 7 o'clock, in that same setting, we'll have a, uh, review, a presentation of the preferred concept. And then again, we'll do a quick debrief when we're all done and uh, see how we fared. The presumption here is that we're going to come away with a consensus at the end of that, or at least if there's a couple of things that are maybe nagging uh, challenges that we need to fix, we'll at least have identified what they are. And this is 
for the charrette portion of our assignment, this is the key outcome. Stakeholder consensus on a preferred strategy. We want to have identified uh, the uses, or it might be singular, but it might be plural, uh, the uses, scale and organization, access and circulation, what it might look like, and a kind of a macro level financial pro forma, which is crucial because the last thing we want to do is bring something uh, forward to the public that that we aren't secure about financially because we want to tell people with some confidence this is the intention moving forward. And that, I believe, is my last slide. Uh, any questions? Questions from Mr. Hitchcock from the dais? <coughs> from anyone? Alderman Bruno, I see you positioning. Yes. yes. Thank, you. thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to say uh, thanks. I'm really looking forward to it. I think this is a really exciting uh, thing that uh, uh, we're both, uh, all parties are putting skin in the game, Mr. Patzelt and Craig uh, and the Shodine Family Foundation and the city. I think uh, it is a, it's a critical gateway property and uh, I'm hoping that we can land on something that we all can buy into. Thanks. Indeed, we are, we are really excited about the progress we've made and the cooperation from everybody helping out and, and uh, we're excited about it. <clears throat> Anyone else on the dais? Uh, Alderman Ruby? Um, I believe last time you spoke you mentioned there would be experts in, in these meetings to quickly um, answer whether or not an idea is financially feasible. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we have, uh, Bridget Lane is doing the market economics and she is already starting to develop, I don't want to say a model because it makes it sound like we've got it figured out and nothing could be further from the truth, but sort of a template, if you will, so that we can start to plug in different values and so that we can churn through that rather quickly. Okay. Yes. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Before I forget, Alderman Burghart on the phone, any questions or comments oh, from Mr. Hitchcock? Yes. Thank you. Anyone else on the dais? Great. Anyone from the audience? Mr. Campbell, oh, join us at the podium. Can you please join us at the podium? Thank you, sir. Uh, Colin Campbell. One quick question. Uh, when this process is completed, who then does the actual architectural engineering work? Does that come to your group or does that go out for bid? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and just in case it wasn't uh, perfectly clear, the question is, is when we get done with this process, is, is there another round of bidding or d does somehow all of this work come to us? We're currently under contract to do the charrette and the entitlement piece that follows. Um, when we're presuming everything goes as scripted, when we get done with the entitlement, the property will have its zoning and there will be a development agreement in place. To be sure, uh, those are not construction documents. Those are not permit documents. And so at that point, the developer would be free to do whatever he would see fit. We would hope that we would have earned the trust of everyone involved and that we might stay involved. But uh, our job is to get us to the, the end of the zoning, we'll call it for the lack of a better word. Anyone else in the audience mm. before I recognize Alderman Kilberg? Alderman Kilberg? Uh, <clears throat> what, uh, what potential optics, ob uh, obstacles exist outside of the, uh, uh, the, um, the criteria or the, uh, the, uh, the scope of the charrette? Are there uh, uh, outs what outside factors beyond what's involved in the process itself could uh, be an obstruction to the, the process to the moving forward? An obstruction to the process. Uh, boy, <clears throat> I, I'm not sure how to answer that. I, I, don't, I, don't, I honestly don't see, I mean, aside from once we get past the charrette itself, because we have that so tightly scripted, 
once we get past that, you know, there's there's always possibilities that meetings might get pushed or right. know, we the process might get stretched out more than what we would anticipate. But we don't see anything. Uh, if 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 we're successful, <coughs> when we're successful next week, because we're looking at it as a strategy and not just a diagram, our our hope is that that will set the foundation for a successful entitlement process, including the development agreement. Okay, thank you, Alderman McGowan. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Hi, Mr. Hitchcock. Thank you for all of this information. It sounds like the charrette process is going to be extremely thorough and um, I am also eager to have the process begin and I'm really interested in in how it goes and the updates that you mentioned we'll be receiving and and the outcome um, I have a question regarding the day that the the ideas presented are narrowed down mm -hmm. who is who is going to be involved in that process and how are the how are certain ideas or suggestions um, going to be eliminated that is a great question the of course is, is in, in what well, you know what maybe here's the better way to do this I'm, I'm gonna go to this one the consultant team and the local team during the course of the charrette week are going to be together a lot and, and again this is the fundamental purpose for having the charrette is that we've got some key people in the room pretty much all the time or at least at our disposal so if something pops up we don't have to wait for you know three weeks from Tuesday to get an answer we can we can get an answer pretty quickly so we will be hashing through on Tuesday. Here we go. On Tuesday, we'll be hashing through the first batch of ideas. And between the consultant team and the local team, we will be narrowing it down to the few, that, the few. There could be six, there could be four, there could be three. The ideas that we think have the most merit. Now, what we're doing then on Wednesday is we're saying, okay, let's put all these back under the microscope and using this checklist that we've developed, let's see how, how well these are holding up as we sc score them um, ourselves. And by the end of the day, our intent is to present, we hope really no more than three uh, ideas about the site to the public because frankly if, if we present more than that it just makes it kind of chaotic and it also means that we haven't done a very good job winnowing down the, uh, the opportunities so that is the intent on, on, on Wednesday really no more than three but our, our, we are very eager to hear on Wednesday evening frankly how we're doing and so we'll get feedback from uh, a great many sources of some some of the key stakeholders uh, at, at the briefing at four o'clock and again those might be some public officials for instance um, we also uh, are eager to hear from the public obviously any stakeholder we've interviewed during the course of the preceding days they're automatically welcome and encouraged to come back and give us feedback and, and we're actively seeking that and we will put our information online on Wednesday so that during the course of the day on Thursday now again it, this is all getting compressed into a small period of time but we might st even get some additional feedback from some of what we see online so that by the end of the day Thursday what we're bringing forward is something that we have a lot of confidence in and the by we I mean the consultant team at the core the local team is obviously going to have to be feeling very strongly about it or we're never going to make it out of the room um, and and th those are the 
those are the key participants in the decision making. But Wednesday evening is really important. Well, Wednesday afternoon and evening, very important because we'll be hearing from other folks then as we test out our ideas and see if, if they're holding up. Okay, thank you for that ex sure. explanation. I also wanted to ask quickly about the survey. What, yes. is, what day does the survey, the online survey end? Oh, another excellent question. We, we were actually just talking about this earlier in the day. Uh, we're thinking we're gonna uh, draw the line in the sand probably on Monday. Uh, and then uh, we're exploring, we're not exactly sure what the form it's gonna take, but we're exploring a couple of follow-up questions that we will tee up on um, Wednesday after we get this other information uh, posted. Okay, and I'm sorry, Stephanie, will the city website kind of notify residents that the survey is coming to an end, or is that already being planned? Here, we actually, we ran through, and I'm going to, I don't have my notes in front of me, but generally speaking, the, uh, the I'm sorry, I just, that was, that was extremely rude. That was, that my wife would have just hit me alongside the head for that one. Uh, but we just, we did just, we went through this at, right at the top of our four o'clock meeting. We're thrilled with the cooperation we're getting from uh, your uh, community relations person, expert. I can't think of his last name. Kevin is his first name. But, but we are, we are in, we're in social media, we're in the press, we're in uh, the Geneva communication. So it's like virtually everything that you are communicating with your residents, there's something going on, including the website. So we will, um, we were just talking about how we might refine what the end of this immediate survey looks like. We have some things that we're gonna, we have to refine some schedule. We've gotta get that on there. We will identify that, that we're gonna draw the line in the sand of the survey uh, on Monday to answer your question directly. And then, uh, like I said, we're gonna tee up a, a, a follow-up question, which we haven't exactly framed up yet, but that's gonna get on there. And every day of the charrette week, we will update in fact, our communications person is going to be here with us. So photographs, anything like this presentation, for instance, this little charrette preview, this goes on the website tomorrow morning. So everything that we do, as soon as we get authorization from the local team who represents both halves of the sponsors, uh, it ends up on the, it will go on the website. So there will be pretty much continuous updates all the way through Thursday is our intent. So the results of the survey will also be put on the we're, we're going, website? Yes, we're going, to, uh, we're going to summarize the survey results on Monday evening. I mean, we could frankly take an hour to do that. and We've got no intention of doing that. But we're gonna summarize them very briefly. We have dozens and dozens of comments in the open-ended questions. That will all get posted on the website, so everything's going to be up there. Um, but we, what we don't want to do is to start posting the summary information until we close the survey, because people who are expert in this sort of thing, and it makes sense to me, you don't want to start steering people. It's sort of like election night results. You know, it's like, well, we've got early results, in, and then people think, well, gee, Maybe I should get on that bandwagon, or I hate that idea. I should call my friends and make sure that we go the other direction. When we, when we draw the line in the sand on, on Monday, or maybe it'll be Friday, but it'll, whenever we do that, uh, then we'll start to reveal the results, because otherwise it would just, it would compromise the integrity of the results. Very great, good. great following question. Thank you. It's a for me. Anyone else on the dais <clears throat> from the audience? Last chance. Ms. Dawkins, did you want to say something? No. There is no action tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Hitchcock, thank you. Thank you. And I would like to that. publicly acknowledge uh, certainly the council's support of this process and, of course, the support of our friends from the Shodin Family Foundation. Um, I think all of you would agree that sometimes leaps of faith are a little bit frightening, but when you do it together, it's a, those, that fear is mollified. So we are in this together. We look forward to working with you, and we thank you very much for your participation. Thanks. Thank you. 
Yeah, didn't it though? It's like, I just got it off the internet, I thought. Item 3C, folks, is the Economic Development Department presentation from none other than our Director of Economic Development, Kathleen Tomashenko. Welcome, Kathleen. So the, the, you know, the purpose of our uh, annual report is to just tell you a little bit about um, some things that our department works on and some of the tools that we have to um, achieve the goals that are set for us every year. Um, last year, um, we talked about uh, sales tax rebates agreements. And just to summarize, we talked to you about how we had 22 in place since 1997. Um, four were still active, four were incomplete. Uh, four had closed post-rebate about 10 years after the rebate expired and 10 of them were still operating today after the rebate had expired. Um, we, we put it through a, a rate of return and we talked to you about how during the rebate um, we had about almost a four dollars for each dollar rebated rate of return and then we also discussed some of the non-tangible benefits of of those agreements so this year we want to um, talk about public private partnerships which is another tool and and really this is a a useful tool when the municipality wants to be very deliberate in its economic growth is that going to work no okay there we go so public partner, public private partnerships, they exist all over the municipality, but we're specifically going to talk about those that are in place for economic development purposes. And they're really creative alliances to achieve that common uh, goal. And you know, the little graphic is showing you that the common goal is really progress for the community. And you're working to implement an economic growth objective or a development goal for a specific site. So when we look at growth objectives, these are sort of things like um, diversif diversifying the tax base or bringing affordable housing to the community or creating more entertainment uses. And we see these within our city plans, uh, our comprehensive plans, our uh, strategic plan that's set forth um, and and updated each year with new goals. So those are the types of implementation that you're trying to use these public-private partnerships to further. Um, usually they always involve some type of public financing assistance to support the project and to be able to align that public policy objective with the marketplace. So sometimes they're not feasible without public participation, and you're really trying to close a gap or further a goal. And sometimes they also include public levers or interventions in partnership. And what this means is really public policy to try to push forward the objective and facilitate the development outcome that you're trying to reach. So one thing that's really different when you're looking at a public-private partnership is the city's role and a municipality's role in these types of efforts. So in a traditional real estate project, the developer is pushing forward the development outcomes and they're talking about you know, what piece of land and how they want to develop that. And the municipality is more of a receptor and the municipality is working to make sure that the development um, is is completed in a way that is supportive of community health, public safety, welfare. So we're looking at zoning, we're looking at building codes, we're looking at fire codes, and we're looking at our utilities and how those are being serviced. And we're doing the regulatory review of those um, developments. In a public-private partnership, the municipality is really taking more of an active role in trying to facilitate development 
that meets certain strategies or goals of the plans and ensuring that the project moves forward. And in this type of partnership, what you're typically doing is you're trying to share the risk and to improve the feasibility of the project. So instead of a municipality taking all the risk and outlaying uh, utility improvements and saying, you know, if we build it, they will come, that's the risk that we're taking, or a developer taking the risk of going through the entire public process and it not being something that the municipalities are supportive, you're kind of spreading the risk between the two parties because you have that same goal back to that original graphic of me being together in um, meeting your stated goal. So there's typically steps for successful public-private partnerships and these are in development. Um, this is something that the APA has studied and how you can, how you can get to a successful state. So, First, you want to identify your compel compelling development strategy. And you want to make sure that that vision is shaped by the community and that there's public benefits to that end goal. And you want to make sure that you're informed by the real estate market realities and you're not trying to do something that won't be supported in the end by the market. And you want to make sure that you're still adhering to your sound planning practice practices and principles um, of the uh, goal of the municipality to further planning. Um, a lot of times to have a successful public-private partnership, the city or the municipality is also working to try to prepare the site and the area for development. Sometimes that involves land assembly or preparing sites by clearing a site or cleaning a site. Sometimes you're investing in the infrastructure whether it's um, actually laying down infrastructure or just making sure that your service area can be expanded and you're increasing the amount of um, support that your system can handle. Um, you're facilitating entitlements and sometimes the approval process to further, to further the goal. Um, the third step is really making sure that you have a capable development partner and that's, that's your private sector person and also assembling a team. And sometimes that means for the city bringing uh, some additional experts to the table, making sure that you have all the needed advice to further your plan. You want to then um, identify what public assistant tools are available. And here is a list um, that we put together from the most common uh, tools that are used. Um, the APA has, um, American Planning Association has published this list. What's, what's really important um, to talk about at this juncture in, in this list is some of the limitations that the city of Geneva presently has with utilization of some of these tools. So because uh, Geneva is not a home rule municipality, we have to make sure that we're always adhering to um, the state statute. So if we wanted to choose one of these tools as something that we felt made a lot of sense for the deal, we would have to go back to the state statute and make sure that we could utilize that tool in the situation that we're in. Um, last year when I did speak about the sales tax rebates, I, I told you about some of the qualifications that you would have to do in order to do that. So in the past, the city of Geneva um, has been more enabled because we had several business districts in place. We had three different business districts that were in place in the past, one in the downtown, one at Avril um, in the Geneva Corporate Park, and then also one on Randall Road. Since that time, those have all expired and they have not been renewed. Under a business district, you are able to uh, enter into contracts with private entities to further your published plan. So some of the things that I'm going to show you and some of the case studies later, we, we wouldn't be able to do some of those today under the current uh, circumstance we're in. We do, of course, have a couple TIF districts, so we, we could do more things in those areas. So um, getting to the last couple steps in the um, successful partnership, we, you want to make sure that you're right-sizing the amount of public assistance. 
So you want to look at all of your eligible project costs, understand the capacity of the public uh, financing source, understand what the developer can do and is willing to do from a market perspective, and then figure out the exact right amount of assistance that is uh, appropriate. So you want to structure a fair deal and you want to make sure that you're monitoring that project performance into the future so that you're continuing to meet your goal of, of where you want to be and why you structured this in the first place. So I have a few case studies to show um, that have uh, been very fruitful and successful for the city. Um, the first case study is the riverfront development and the green strategies, those are the six um, steps that we just overviewed and I'm, I'm trying to show you in the other column with the black writing what exactly was done. So you had the development strategy here as published um, in the documents at the time was to revitalize the downtown and beautify the 37 and a half acre riverfront property. And in order to prepare the site for development, the city uh, did go out and do some land assembly and clean up. Um, there was out and out purchase of properties. Uh, there was, in one case, a sale back to the developer, but in other cases, there were dedications of that property after it was, it was assembled. You had a few development partners uh, that worked with the city on the different um, sites you can see you've got the the Harrington Geneva place and then the Geneva condominiums there the river um, condominiums um, so and the types of tools that were used was there was a TIF in place that was TIF 1 there was SSA it was an SSA 1 there was another SSA put in place for this uh, contribution of public property there were fee waivers uh, flexible development standards that were used developer reimbursements and utility upgrades to really lay the groundwork for these um, some of the contributions some of the public uh, what the public funded how that money was used was to uh, fund land acquisition remediate uh, dem demolish buildings engineering costs, utility and site improvements, uh, public access connections to create open space areas, River Park, uh, streetscape, public parking lots, and signalization improvements. So it was quite a lot um, of public uh, inducement that went into those developments, which I think a lot of people would view as very successful for the city. Future monitoring came with the uh, Com with the uh, maintenance of SSA 1 that was put into place to maintain those parking lots and some of those improvements into the future. Uh, the next case study that is uh, of significance is the way that the Geneva Industrial Park was developed in the early 90s and it's still really being developed today because we still have open space in that area and we also still have open agreements um, in in the vicinity so the development strategy was published in the Avril uh, business district plan and it was to achieve a balance of land uses and diversify the tax base and also to increase employment so the, in order to prepare the site for development the city undertook infrastructure upgrades and extensions for all of our utilities electric sewer and water the city assembled some land for a substation and also for some easements uh, the city uh, worked to further the road construction and signalization out in that area our development partners were a few of the uh, industries the early industries industrial hard chrome was the first company to come in and they not only took down the site that they were building they took down a few other sites and they later became homes to some of our other successful companies that are still operating today continental envelope was another leader in the area that that took down larger piece of property and and laid some additional utilities for future as did Pillsbury and Millard so those were really the the, the um, people that helped to grow the park incrementally over the years um, the city used a lot of tools um, SSA a business district 
uh, geo bonding, revenue bonding for uh, electric, sewer, water, um, SSA bonds in addition to SSA um, uh, taxes, uh, contribution of public property, uh, connection and per permit fee waivers, flexible development standards, utility upgrades that were output in advance, reimbursement agreements, which are still in place today and uh, still uh, active, um, industrial revenue bonds, and property tax abatements. So how did they use the money that was generated is in the, in the next sentence. There was uh, public-private improvements, utility, site work, pretty much everything that was touched by one of these uh, inducements. And the area continues to be monitored as there's uh, still SSA and tax abatements, uh, active um, reimbursement agreements in the district. So the, the last case study I want to talk about is a little bit smaller. Uh, this is in the downtown. This was the third in James Street. Uh, the development strategy was really to work to replace um, what was there with the longstanding business of the Mary Lee shops and the adaptive reuse of their larger storage spaces and commercial spaces. And what we see today, we have some of our most successful businesses along the Third Street um, new storefronts, the new restaurant came in, um, All Chaka Kitchen, and um, the restaurant to the, uh, to the um, that would be the east of it. Um, to prepare the site for development, the city relocated electric uh, service lines and eliminated poles, uh, constructed new sidewalks and parking areas. The development partner uh, was Simon Properties and the City of Geneva. Um, this is uh, an example of what we, we probably wouldn't be able to do these things today as we could prior because the business district was in place and it enabled um, the tools to be utilized like they were. Um, there was a sales tax rebate, which just ended in, in 2017, an exchange of public land, a licensing agreement. Um, the funding helped to do the public improvements and the private uh, upgrades uh, that were necessary for the utilities and also the buildings. And it was future uh, monitored into the future. We still have the licensing agreement and SSA-1 is in place, and like I said, the sales tax rebate just expired in 2017. It met its uh, maximum payout. So we're actually in the midst of a couple partnerships right now. One is Mill Race, which we just talked about. Uh, we are, as you know, we um, are in the midst of, we uh, are working to finance half the cost of the charrette and the entitlements. And there may be a possibility for further participation from the public, depending on how the charrette uh, works out and what exactly is the development strategy there and whether there's another opportunity for the public to participate or not will be determined. So we um, have our development partner, Shodin Family Foundation, and I have some to be determines there as we work through the process. And then the other current partnership that we're working on and we've been working on for quite a while is the SEMP, um, the industrial development to the east of the city. So we have, um, in order to prepare for this development, the city has, has a, a big history of planning for it. We have um, documents that go back all the way to 1957 where the city was planning for industrial development in this area. We've got boundary agreements in place that have put the city's uh, boundary stakes with West Chicago to say this is what the city of Geneva will develop and this is how we will develop it. In 2012, the city went out very strongly and worked on the SEMP plan to really create a roadmap for that project. There's been public financing for phase one and phase two of Couts Road. Um, significant utility planning uh, easement work. At the same time, our development partner, uh, Midwest Industrial Fund, they've acquired property, they've put property together, uh, spent time to and money on engineering and project planning. 
This project is really a good example of sharing the risk. In probably 2013 or 14, the city had worked to uh, determine whether they wanted to move forward with putting an electric substation out there, and there were some conversations at the city council level, and those uh, that was not done. We I don't think that the city was interested in building it and hoping development would come. Instead, the strategy was that we would work to try to find a development partner to try to carry the risk uh, along with the city. And you've got developer risk with assembling the land. You've got city risk with investment into planning and uh, utilities. So you, you have good potential for um, an extremely successful private-public partnership to come. So that is all I had on this, uh, if there's any questions or if anybody would like to revisit anything that was discussed, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Uh, questions or comments from the dais? Alderman Swanson. We talked about the, uh, the mill race in earlier, but uh, going to the southeast uh, plan, where are we in the six steps? Are we getting close to right-sizing the public assistance? Uh, it looks like we've identified the developer, so uh, I'll leave that to you. Where are we in the six steps? So we, um, we have uh, worked to, um, you know, we've, we've got the development strategy. We have been working to prepare the site for development. We um, have a, a development partner assembling the team. We are working to identify the public assistance tools. We are working to right size the amount of public assistance and we're working to structure the fair deal. So we're still working on that side of the ledger. And time frame, any, any idea? We are hoping that this is a, a, a first step in continuing discussions about this project. Over the summer, uh, we expect to bring more information forward. Thank you. Anyone else in the dais? <clears throat> Alderman Berghart by phone. Any questions or comments for the director? No, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We find ourselves at item four, ladies and gentlemen, amendments to the agenda. Are there any amendments this evening offered by the council? Item five is the omnibus agenda. All items marked with an asterisk are considered to be retained by this council and can be considered and voted upon with one motion. Is there such a motion? So moved. Motion by Alderman Bruno. Seconded by Alderman Swanson. Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Bruno. Aye. Burkhardt. Clements? Aye. Ruby? Aye. Caven? Aye. Kilberg? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. McGowan? Aye. Swanson? Aye. The omnibus agenda passes with 10 affirmative votes, zero nay votes, and zero absent. We skip down to item number 10, municipal bills for payment. We kindly ask our city clerk to read the bills in their aggregate for our consideration. Total bills for payment. Three million two hundred forty-six thousand three hundred seven dollars and sixty-three cents. Mayor, I move that we approve and pay the bills as read. The individual items that add up to that amount can be found in tonight's city council packet on the city website. Alderman Bruno makes the motion to pay the bills as presented, which are also available on the website and in our council packets this evening. Is there a second? Second. Alderman Clements makes the second. Questions or comments? Any questions or comments, Alderman Burkhart? Uh, no, not for me. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Bruno? Aye. Burkhart? Burkhart, aye. Clements? Aye. Ruby? Aye. Haven? Aye. Kilberg? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. McGowan? Aye. Swanson? Aye. Item 10, municipal bills for payment, passes unanimously with 10 affirmative votes, zero nay votes, and zero absent. We skip two. Item number 12A, recommend approval of resolution number 2019-61, adopting a speed control and traffic calming policy. Is there a motion? Second. Alderman Clemens makes Second. a motion. Seconded by Alderman Marks, is that? Mm -hmm. Forgive me. Mm -hmm. Ms. Dawkins? Sure. 
So uh, you'll recall on June 3rd, the Speed Control Policy Task Force made a presentation to the City Council along with some recommendations. Um, originally, the task force was formed to take a look at this particular policy. So through the review of the policy and other simil similar policies, they determined that the speed control policy was outdated and difficult to read. So the policy in front of you this evening is the efforts, um, their efforts, and they unanimously recommend uh, approval for adoption. This is only one of several recommendations they made, but this is certainly the easiest one to implement with no cost involved and we can do right away and start moving some of the recommendations forward. Any additional questions or comments? <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Bruno. Aye. Burkhardt. Aye. Clements. Aye. Ruby. Aye. Cabin. Aye. Kilberg. Aye. Moladra. Aye. Marks. Aye. McGowan. Aye. Swanson. Aye. Item 12A passes unanimously with 10 affirmative votes, zero nay votes, and zero absent. We are at new business, ladies and gentlemen. Anyone from the audience? Any new business questions, comments, concerns? Yes. My name is Madeline Roth, and I'd like to pass something out. I'd like to read a series of emails that I um, had between myself and Andrew Heckenkamp, who is the Survey and National Register Coordinator at the Illinois State Historic Preservation Office in Springfield, Illinois. So I'd just like to get the truth out. Um, on May 3rd, I asked Andrew, dear Andrew, would you please confirm and return email that 520 Ray Street, Geneva has not been nominated for the National Register. On May 6, I got an email from Andrew that said, Madeline, 520 Ray Street in Geneva is not listed in the National Register of Historic Places. It has also not been nominated to the National Register, nor does the office have any report of an application ever being filed for the property. Please note that an individual property cannot be formally listed in the National Register if that owner objects to its designation. So anything else that's out there is forged. And so that's what I would like to get on public record. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anyone else joining us this evening? Any questions or comments? Alderman Berger, anything from? No, that's good. Thank you. From the dais? Ladies and gentlemen, we'll enter, or I'll entertain, rather, a motion to adjourn to closed session to discuss pending litigation. Is there such a motion? So moved. Motion by Marks. Second. Seconded by McGowan. Uh, there is no action taking place following our brief closed session. A roll call would be in order. Mr. Clerk, whenever you're ready. <coughs> Bruno. Aye. Burkhardt. Burkhardt, aye. Clements. Aye. Ruby. Aye. Cabin. Aye. Kilberg. Aye. Oladra. Aye. Marks. Aye. McGowan. Aye. Swanson. Aye. We'll be back momentarily, folks. The cameras will be turned off, as will the microphones. The microphones are back on, folks. I will entertain a motion to return to open session. So moved. Motion by Alderman Marks. Seconded by Alderman Clements. A voice vote is sufficient. All in favor of returning to open session, please indicate by saying, heck yeah. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. That's City Attorney. That's not a proper motion. <laughs> Not a proper response. Or you asked for heck yeah. <laughs> okay, all, all in favor say aye. Aye. Good Lord. Thank you. Anyone opposed? <laughs> Except for the city attorney. Without objection, folks, we'll convene our committee of the whole meeting. But first, how about I entertain a motion to adjourn the city council meeting? See what happens? Thanks. See? Anyone want to adjourn? City so, second. Motion by. Bruno, seconded by Marks. All in favor of adjourning? We don't need a second, that's right. This meeting is adjourned of the City Council, ladies and gentlemen. Took the motion. Hmm? All in favor. All in favor, say aye. Yeah. I said if no one objects. Okay. <laughs> You're killing me tonight. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, tonight's Committee of the Whole meeting is called to order. Let the record show that all the aldermen are present, and we need to dial in our dear friend, uh, Alderman Burkhart, which we will do momentarily. <laughs>
Kara? Okay, okay we're ready to start the next meeting. That could be coming up later. Okay. Go. Terry, you're present. Hi. Yep, there you are. Hello. We are. Oh, okay. We are convened at the Committee of the Whole meeting. Thank you. Excellent. Item two, folks, is to approve regular Committee of the Whole minutes from June 3rd, 2019. Is there a motion? So moved. Alderman Marks makes the motion. Second. Alderman, Cle Alderman Clements makes the second. All in favor of approving? Please aye. say aye. 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 Alderman Burkhart? Burkhart, aye. Motion is unanimous. Uh, just a brief uh, housekeeping measure, ladies and gentlemen. Immediately following a motion and a second to move an agenda item to the floor, I will invite City Administrator Dawkins to provide a synopsis of the topic prior to opening the floor for questions from the dais, staff, and public. Item 3A, consider draft ordinance number 2019-10, amending Title IV, Business and License Regulations, Chapter 2, Liquor Control, Section 4-2-11, License classifications, amending descriptions of Class C6 retail sale of beer in connection with on site brewery. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion by Clements. Second. Seconded by Marks. Ms. Dawkins. Sure. Uh, Penrose Brewing is requesting that the city bring its code in line with the state's liquor regulations, which allow breweries to sell beer and cider, cider that are not manufactured on their premises for consumption on premises only. The draft ordinance reflects the state language that was adopted in two, 2018. Um, I know we have a representative from Penrose here with us tonight, so if you have additional questions, you may address it. I'm sorry, I don't know if you're Brad or Tom. I'm Brad, yes. To uh, Brad Novak. Mr. Novak, welcome. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Good, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Novak, one of the greatest Iowa fans of all time? That's my brother. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay. Are you an Iowa fan? I am an Iowa fan, but you're thinking my brother was I am Herky. thinking your brother who yes. was the mascot yeah. for the University of Iowa. It was. That's scary. Yes, sir. We're glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Any having questions you. for the other Mr. Novak? Yes, sir. Uh, could you just explain uh, what's, what's taking place here then? Are you going to be marketing other... Um, uh, the state of Illinois adopted a law that allows other breweries like ours to offer beer of other breweries. So guest beer, guest taps. So we are looking to kind of keep up with the Joneses and allow us to sell beer from other breweries. Okay. Uh, has this put you at a handicap? Uh, in some regards? I would say that most municipalities are allowing this to happen. So I know they just went through this in St. Charles and Naperville. For us, we kind of supplement what we're currently doing and probably offer like ciders and meads and things that we don't do. Maybe some dark beers. Okay, thank you. Alderman Caven. So these, these other things that you would offer there, they can be consumed on site or they can be sold as like a packaged good as well? I think it's only on site. No, it's on -site. only on site consumption. It's only on site, so it's not packaged once Correct. you go like. Yes, they sir. can only the sell their goods, product. Goods, whatever they sell there for consumption there. Correct. Okay. So it's really, excuse me, tap beer. Okay. Just, okay. Thank you. Anyone else on the day? Is Alderman Bruno. How are you? Well, just, I'm well. Good. Uh, I was just there the other day. Yeah, the, I know. Uh, uh, so just to build on that so you'd have uh, another brewery say Salamoth or Goose Island that might yes, sir. come in and take over a, a, a tap or two yes sir but you can't sell those growlers I'm getting I don't on. believe we can fill growlers no, no it's they just can, they can only sell their own product yeah Got it. this one is just strictly on-site only yes that's it thanks anyone else in the dais Mr. Clerk, when you're available, please take the roll. Bruno. Aye. Burkhardt. Burkhardt, aye. Clements. Aye. Ruby. Aye. Cabin. Aye. Kilberg. Aye. Maladra. Aye. Marks. Aye. McGowan. Aye. Swanson. Aye. Item 3A passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you for your support. Appreciate Thank you. Thanks for sticking around, too. Item 3B, folks, is to consider draft resolution number 2019-62, 
authorizing the execution of a master equity lease agreement in an amount not to exceed $955,000 and related amendments with Enterprise FM Trust. Subject to final review by city attorney. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion by Alderman Marks. Second. Seconded by Alderman McGowan. We will have a, oops, excuse me. Ms. Dawkins. Okay, sure. Um, staff has been exploring methods of providing uh, a safe and cost-effective citywide fleet. In the past, leasing has been considered but dismissed as it did not appear to meet the city's needs. Uh, we recently revisited the potential of leasing with Enterprise who offer an open-ended lease as, an, as opposed to the traditional closed lease option. The recommendation before the City Council this evening is to enter into a lease agreement with Enterprise to lease 20 vehicles in fiscal year 20 as opposed to what we've budgeted, which is to buy seven vehicles outright. Um, prior to your uh, consideration of this recommendation, I would ask that you hear first from our enterprise representatives. We have Gabby Harding and Sam Denton with us this evening. Uh, they have a short presentation, and then certainly we can answer any questions you might have on how this program uh, may benefit the city and differs from a traditional lease program. Gabby? Sam? Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right, so as Stephanie said, we'll go through a very quick PowerPoint presentation and then open it up for questions at the end. Um, so again, my name is Gabby Harding. I'm an account executive with Enterprise Fleet Management. Um, so fleet management's different than kind of probably the local rental branches that you've seen before. Um, we do kind of take what we learn from the rental side and apply it to municipalities like yourself. I'll talk a little bit more about what that means uh, later on. So this just goes to show that our program has been nationally vetted out by cooperatives. Um, I know that the city is currently a member of Sourcewell, formerly NJPA. Um, they did release a bid for fleet management about a year ago. We were deemed the lowest cost provider. So rather than spending time and money to kind of do an RFP on your own, this kind of takes care of the due diligence process for you. Here's some of our current partners um, in Illinois. Across the country, we have over 1,000 customers in the government space, 30,000 vehicles on lease. This is one of the fastest growing sectors of our business. In Illinois, no, in Illinois alone, in Chicagoland, we've brought in about 15 customers in the last 12 months. All of our customers work with us in various capacities. For example, the city of Chicago is one of our oldest customers. They've been with us for about 25 years. What we do for them is a little bit different than what we do for Freeport and Romeoville. So this is everything that we offer as a fleet management company. Again, our customers utilize us for different services. You know, we help our customers acquire vehicles. We offer funding lines, you know, leasing that Stephanie mentioned we're going to talk about, fuel programs, maintenance programs, resale. Um, really with us, um, to kind of tie it all together, you're going to get an account manager. So that person's going to meet with you a couple times a year to fleet plan kind of based on your, on your budget year, analyze your costs year over year, and make recommendations based on math. Going back to kind of what we do on the rental side, um, we kind of find, we found the right time to get out of all of our depreciating assets on the rental side. So our goal is to find that time for municipalities and our customers. Um, so before the vehicle, you know, starts to depreciate too much and we lose the uh, maintenance and the fuel expenses go up. Um, so example for a municipality, you buy vehicles so well, you put really low mileage patterns on them, that that vehicle's worth a ton of money in three, four, or five years. So what we found with the replace the 20 vehicles that we're going to place with the city, the optimal holding period that we're going to recommend is about five years for those vehicles. So again, those vehicles are worth a ton of money after you know five years and 25,000 miles. It looks different for every single vehicle, but our goal is to find the right time for every single vehicle. Once we found that right time, rather than paying cash, um, for that, if the vehicle's $30,000, you're essentially paying for the part of the vehicle that you're going to use. So if a truck is $30,000, and we know after five years and 25,000 miles that that vehicle is going to sell for 15, we're going to write that vehicle down to 10. So after the five years and 25,000 miles, that vehicle sells for 15,000. The difference between what we sold it for and what we wrote it down to is yours in equity. So most of our customers take that equity and roll them into their new leases to lower their new replacements, those monthly payments. But essentially the idea there is rather than having a $30,000 cash outlay, you essentially have a $15,000 cash outlay. I'm sure we'll have questions at that for the end. 
And here's just some of our objectives um, that we have for the city. So we want to reduce the average age of your fleet to no more than five years, maximize the equity and the appreciating assets, come up with a sustainable replacement plan that really drives down the total cost of ownership. Questions? Questions or comments from Ms. Harding from the dais, Alderman Swanson. What if you go beyond the five-year term? For, for example, we have 20 cars here, and uh, the eight in the wastewater fund are all 60-month leases, which is five years. What happens if we want to keep some of them beyond that? Can we do that? Yeah, absolutely. So at the end of the fourth year, or probably beginning of the fourth year, we're going to look at that see you know where are we at in the market does it make sense to sell that vehicle does it make sense to hold on to it for a little bit longer based on math we'll make that recommendation and then the city can obviously make that decision on your own it's not like a traditional dealership lease where you're penalized for over mileage or wear and tear or anything like that there's actually no mileage or anything like that in in this lease agreement it was my understanding no mileage restriction now for example we have a car here that uh, a 350 super cab that the total lease cost is 58476 which is a 60-month lease. Okay. I'm assuming that a piece of that 58000 would represent finance charges. Yes. Which is the cost of your going out and buying that. What is, what is the amount of that? What is the rate that you're using, and, and how could we determine what the finance charge piece is? So your interest rate, rate is 4.9%. It's based on the three-year T-bill plus 300 basis points, and it's fixed at time of delivery. Um, and, and fixed about the life of the lease. So all of these vehicles have a 4.9% premium baked in because we're leasing them. Correct. At, at this point in time. Now another question I have, we have eight vehicles going to the water department, replacing eight vehicles that we've owned since 2007, 2008, 2013, 2015. Now all of a sudden we have eight vehicles that are all 2019. So what happens in five years? Are we going to replace all of those? We've gone from having staggered vehicle purchases to now having everything day one, 2019 vehicles. How would that work five years out? It would be the goal. Um, so again, to Gabby's point, as we sit down in fleet plan, a year before those vehicles are set to come to term, we look at your total holding cost on that vehicle. We project out what your new holding cost would be with the new vehicle, and we make a rec uh, replacement recommendation then. If we sit down a year before that lease is set to come to term and it doesn't make financial sense to replace the vehicle, we're not going to make that recommendation. Um, but the goal would be on a light duty vehicle, one ton and below specifically, to flip your fleet every five years because with the math, a five year holding period with your unique ability to buy a vehicle really well as a public entity, then our ability to sell that vehicle really well through our various wholesale channels. If you look at that depreciating asset through the lens of total cost of ownership, the math is probably going to tell us to replace that vehicle in five years. So my example, though, is we've had a various aged vehicles that we're all replacing at once. Mm -hmm. So we will be looking at replacing five vehicles again in eight years. Or, I'm sorry, five years. All eight vehicles in five years. Right, yeah, the goal would be to sell those vehicles, and then we get above what you owe us. That equity would come back into the fleet to lower your future lease cost. So the concept is let's sell that vehicle at the right time, keep the equity in the fleet, keep your lease cost low, and hopefully drive down your operational spend. Um, with the thought being that no vehicle in fleet, again, one ton and below, should be any older than five years. Uh, so it's maximizing equity, keep it in the fleet, keep your average age of your fleet to no less than five years, which will drive down your operational spend. And in your example, you had a, a, a wonderful example of if the value was 10000 and at that point in time it was really fifteen. you give us a check for 5000 or we get future credits. What if the inverse is true? You'd what, if be on, what if it's worth less? Yeah, you'd be on the hook for that and probably fire us as your fleet management provider. Okay, so at that point in time, we would have to write you a check. Correct. If, say, if it were $5,000 difference. Correct. But what we do, your account management team will do every single year as you fleet plan and do your annual client review, we look at how the vehicle is appreciating, what you owe today, what the vehicle is worth today, what it's worth in 12 months, what you owe in 12 months. You're always going to know where you are uh, with equity in each vehicle you have in fleet. So that, I'm not saying it's never happened, but if we're doing our job the right way, that should never happen. But there is a risk. Always. That, that we have a risk for an outstanding liability five years down the road for any market change valuation in the resale value of that vehicle. If, right. if the resale value drops 
below what you had been anticipating, we have a liability to you. Correct. And I have a lot of resale data that I can share from our other customers in the public space. Uh, the city of Chicago being one of our largest customers, I just did an analysis for the last 150 vehicles we sold on behalf of the city, um, and I can share that type of data with you to get you comfortable with our ability to sell vehicles at the end of the lease term. I'm happy to provide that. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else on the dais? Alderman Kilberg? Uh, I, I, I might be the only one that has had five years' experience working with uh, enterprise fleet management, and... Uh, uh, my experiences with enterprise have all been very positive from my work perspective. Um, uh, I think they've always been responsive, and I think the communication's always been good. Uh, and uh, our company's always felt that the economics work favorably as well. And we moved from another plan to your plan. We're still on your plan. Or, uh, I'm no longer with the company, but... Uh, uh, it was it was a positive experience. I guess my question would be your fleet service management plans. Would they be the same as uh, 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 for a municipality as it would be for other uh, uh, other organizations that Enterprise works with, other companies that Enterprise works with? Is it administered the same way where there's monthly reports and there's a, a there's alerts when uh, oil, is need, oil needs to be changed and mm -hmm. they have to respond. And are they going to be? Uh, uh, we were giving a uh, given an, uh, a fleet, uh, uh, essentially a fleet card. Mm -hmm. And uh, how does that work then when we're doing those types of service work uh, internally? Yeah. So with respect to our ancillary <laughs> programs, our Sam, can I trouble you just to make oh, sure you're I'm speaking sorry. to the microphone? Yeah. Thank um, you, sir. With respect to our um, our, our our larger business model, nothing changes commercial, private businesses, and in the public space. Um, now, whether or not you do our fuel program and our maintenance program, I still think we're talking through that. Okay. Um, to answer your question directly, you can still maintain your vehicles in-house the way you do today, and nothing has to change. Okay, but this, the reporting and the management of that reporting with Enterprise would still be in place with this agreement? If you're on our maintenance program, yes. Um, but all the reporting with the she wants to talk. So, <laughs> no, I was going to say the city has decided to not move forward with like our maintenance and our fuel programs. So some of the alerts that you are probably getting with your previous company, they're not going to be getting today. Um, the city's just going to continue to maintain everything in house today. So you won't be administering the the management record or the the maintenance records. Correct. Okay. So it'll just be done as it is today. Is there any way that that could be a part of it? Yeah, absolutely. So, so that can be a part of it, but the cost for that exceeds the cost that it costs us to do that in-house. So as we reviewed the plan and, and to do it, that didn't make sense in this particular scenario, since we have the skill and the, the mechanics to do that in-house. And we're looking at doing mostly just preventative. And the record keeping and the continuity Yeah, we, we have a Fleetmatic system that will we'll track all of that. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick uh, check. Alderman Burkhart, safe and sound and back with yeah, us? Right. Excellent. Alderman Maladra, Alderman Marks. Um, so if we were to look at this, we've never leased before. So if we were to look at this as a, as a pilot, as a test, what would our benchmark be for success? Whoever can answer it. I, I would say our benchmark for success is if it, it occurs just as Gabby and Sam have indicated, that at the end of the lease, we actually get money back because the vehicle is actually worth more than what we leased it for. So our success is based on the market treatment of these vehicles. Mm -hmm. And as long as we can increase our, 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 modernize our fleet, save fuel, save maintenance costs, and overall see that all come to fruition. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts, but that would be so, our goal. Okay, so regarding the market price of the car, there's nothing inherent in the lease agreement that guarantees that. Correct. Um, so the only quantifiable, controllable factors is the maintenance aspects and things like that. So how are we going to measure what we would have spent and what we will have spent? Oh, I think, again, we have the Fleetmatic system now, so we know what we're spending today on our fleet. Okay. 
Okay. So we'll be able to compare that to what we're spending on our fleet tomorrow. So in 12 months, we'll have a discussion sure. about it. Absolutely. Because you'll, you'll discuss this again come budget time because, again, this is our first year of trying it. We're not, we're not committing to anything beyond these vehicles. Um, so we'll look at it again. It'll be sooner than later because, as you know, our budget cycle starts very quickly. Um, so we'll, we'll start gathering that data and start making those comparisons and seeing if it makes sense. Alderman Marks? Um, question and answer. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Alderman Burkhart, any comments or questions for our guests? Uh, nothing, nothing for me. Thank you. Alderman Ruby. Um, if, if the city decided to, um, for as a starting point, to lease, um, say, half the number that we're currently looking at, just would the price per lease per vehicle, would it change? So the price, the price per vehicle wouldn't change. Okay. Um, obviously, your cost would probably be cut in half overall from an annual perspective if you did that, but not per vehicle. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Swanson, unless there's someone else who has not yet spoken. Alderman Caven, then Alderman Swanson. So I guess this is probably a question for Stephanie, and I know that this has been discussed a little bit, but as far as starting with the 20 vehicles, did we identify the 20 vehicles? Was that strictly based on age of the ones that we wanted replaced? Or how did we come up with the number of 20 to, to, to use as, if we move forward, the, the trial number or the pilot? Sure. So we had um, several meetings with um, not only Enterprise, but internally with department heads and, and the fleet staff and looked at all of the vehicles. We looked at age predominantly. So we were trying to replace those vehicles that were older, mostly the 2000, anything older than 2007, anything older than 2012. And then we looked at our capital plan and what vehicles were coming up for replacement based on mileage. Um, again, as you will recall, we've delayed replacement vehicles for some time. So only in the last year and a half have we actually started replacing vehicles at a reasonable rate, I would say. Um, so it was kind of looking at all of those factors and working with the departments. I will tell you, they wanted more vehicles. <laughs> we said, no, let's, 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 you know, let's start here and see where we're at. You know, we, um, there are a couple of vehicles that we actually, instead of trading in, will rotate to, to our uh, Geneva Emergency Management Group, whose vehicles are, I won't even begin to tell you, it, it, for an emergency management team, we probably don't want them driving those vehicles. Um, so again, it was, a, it was a collaborative effort, not only with Enterprise, but certainly with uh, our fleet mechanics uh, and all the department heads and those that are responsible. And based off of the number that I'm looking at that was in the packet, and again, I realize that this is only the actual what the out cost would be or actually what would be what would be spent this year going this route is actually a savings over what we would have been spending just to replace the seven vehicles this year that is correct yeah so if you look in the agenda form i think it was yep. 240 versus 207 something close to right yeah pa page eight yes and then the so the not to exceed cost just so everyone's clear is the total length of the lease okay. so that that 955 number is not a yearly cost that is for the total term of all 20 vehicles for the, some vehicles are uh, four years and some are five years. The police vehicles right. are 40. So the police vehicles are four years. So that's the total cost of those leases. Thank you. Alderman Swanson, then Alderman Marks. I, I would like to caution us to not think that we're saving money by replacing 20 vehicles this year versus seven in the budget by doing this leasing plan because there's a cost going forward each and every year related to this lease plan and we are now financing vehicle purchases which we had not done before so at 4.9 percent interest that is an additional charge that we had not been incurring for vehicle purchases in the past so that is a change so so to me to to see if this program is a success we need to ascertain that we are in fact saving that 4.9% interest in fuel. And we are getting back that money in uh, resale value, selling it at the opportune time. So the test program in my mind should be smaller, not 955,000 or close to a million dollars, but we ought to see on a small test basis if it's going to work as planned. So I would be much more comfortable seeing a smaller plan and once we figure out if it does work, expanding it. 
So I think, it, I think we're biting off way more. I think we're making a change to financing something we hadn't before, and we've increased our cost by 4.9%. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Marks. Question for Steph Stephanie, are we still are we responsible then for still doing all of the upgrades that we do for the police cars? The so no, the upgrades are actually well, let me say me. yes and no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if if the upgrades were less than fifty percent of the vehicle, the cost of those upgrades, they're included in the lease. Enterprise works with our outfitting company, so it's the same company we would use to do all the same outfitting. If it's greater than that, then we're not leasing those vehicles. Those vehicles that require a much more like significant add-ons we've determined that that's probably not wise to put into a lease and that we would we would purchase those vehicles okay thank you alderman bruno uh thank you mayor now i know uh utility vehicles we typically had been getting yellow but for resale value optimal is white but with police cars do we have are we changing the color of our police cars here no, we're still having black police cars, um, but you are correct. All the other vehicles will be white. Thank you. Anyone, uh, Alderman Kilberg, unless anyone else who has not yet spoken wishes to do so? As it relates to Alderman Swanson's Alderman com comments, uh, the other downside of this could potentially be that if we run into budgetary challenges in the future, we've got a fixed cost here that's going to be there every year. We can't find savings in our fleet. Uh, is that correct? I mean, in other the, words, we've the, saved when we, during the downturn in the economy, we delayed purchases for a reason because we didn't have the funds to, to replace those vehicles. Uh, this takes away some of our latitude or some of our flexibility as it relates to doing that in the future, right? So it can, yes. At the same time, though, right now, it also frees up our cash flow. So we're, we're actually building in this first year, we're actually building some reserves in that capital equipment fund because, again, we budgeted 2040. We're spending 2007, so we have that difference. But, yes, there is a set expenditure that you will have to make every year during this lease, and there is that potential. So we're making a five-year commitment here, really, that yeah. it's, it's fixed. So... I just wanted to make that one point. I'll just check for the heck of it. Alderman Burghardt? I'm good, thank you. Okay. Anyone else in the dais? <clears throat> Mr. Clerk, whenever you're ready, please take the roll call vote. A simple majority, ladies and gentlemen, advances this to the City Council. Bruno? Aye. Burkhardt? Burkhardt, aye. Clements? Nay. Ruby? Nay. Cabin? Nay. Kilberg? Aye. Maladra? Aye. Marks? Aye. McGowan? Aye. Swanson? Nay. Motion passes with six affirmative votes, four nay votes. This matter will be considered on July the 1st. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Item 3C, ladies and gentlemen, is to consider draft resolution number 2019-63, authorizing execution of a fiscal year 2018-2019 budget amendments as presented. Ms. Dawkins, or excuse me, is there a motion? So moved. Motion by Marks. Second. Second of... <laughs> wow. Second of... Oh, wow. Seconded by Bruno. Ms. Dawkins. Sure. Uh, for the Council's consideration this evening are some year-end budget amendments for fiscal year 2018-2019. Uh, the amendments are in the Motor Fuel Tax, the Strategic Plan Advisory Committee, Beautification, the PEG Fund, SSA Number 16, and Prairie Green Funds. Uh, most of these amendments are provided by fund balance. Uh, this is typically what we do at the end of the year to kind of shore up the accounts. Um, and make sure everything's balanced for the audit. Uh, Rita Cruz is here this evening if you have any additional questions. Questions or comments for our finance manager, Ms. Cruz? 
Hearing none, seeing none, Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. Clements. Aye. Ruby. Aye. Cabin. Aye. Kilberg. Aye. Olaja. Aye. Marks. Aye. McGowan. Aye. Swanson. Aye. Bruno. Aye. Burkhardt. Burkhardt, aye. Item 3C passes unanimously, folks, with 10 affirmative votes, 0 nay votes, and 0 absent. Item 3D is consider draft ordinance number 2019-11, amending Title IX, Municipal Utilities, Chapter 3, Water and Sewer, Article A, Service Rates and Charges. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion by Alderman Bruno. Second. Second by Alderman McGowan. Ms. Dawkins. Sure. Uh, we last updated this title back in 2016. At the time of the update, there were two paragraphs that were inadvertently deleted. So essentially, this is literally just a housekeeping in nature to correct the omission that was not supposed to happen back in 2016. Don't ask me why it took us three years to figure it out, but. <laughs> the quintessential Scribner's error. Right? Correct. Uh, I do, though, have Superintendent Van Gescom here this evening if you have any additional questions. Questions for Ms. Dawkins and or Superintendent Van Gescom? A voice vote will suffice, ladies and gentlemen. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Item 3E is to consider draft ordinance number 2019-12, authorizing execution of First Amendment of lease with T-Mobile Central, LLC, at the Dodson Street Water Tower. So moved. Motion by Alderman Bruno. Second. Seconded by Alderman Marks. Ms. Dawkins. Sure. On July 15th, 2002, the city entered into a lease with T-Mobile Central LLC to install and operate certain antenna facilities at Dodson Street Water Tower. The current lease expires on July 24th, 2022. The tenant in the city desired to enter into the First Amendment of the lease that would provide in part that one, at the expiration of the current lease term on July 24, 2022, the term of the lease would be extended for four additional and successive five-year terms. At the commencement of the first renewal term, the tenant shall pay the city $10,808.75 per quarter, which is the rent. Uh, the rent will be adjusted effective on the first day of the second renewal term and each subsequent renewal term by an amount equal to 15% over the rent for the immediately preceding renewal term. And lastly, the other terms in the current lease would be unchanged. Uh, again, I have Superintendent Van Gescom with us this evening to answer any additional questions. Questions for either Ms. Dawkins or Superintendent Van Gescom? Seeing none, hearing none, either live and or over there. the... Yes, Alderman Burkhardt. Uh, correct. The renewals would be, yes. So typically these companies start bugging us the day after they enter into the first lease agreement um, because they really want to shore up the lease space and the, and the space that they have on our towers so that somebody else doesn't take that space. Yeah, no, it's not unusual at all. And then they have an out. They can give us 30 days notice and uh, get out of the contract. Do we have an out? If we, we have an out as well. The, the renewal leases would, would still have to have our, you know, consent. Um, and there's also an out for any other reason if we needed the tower for some reason or something. Yes. I didn't do the calculations. Hold on. Did you? No, no, I don't. Care. So it's uh, <laughs> ten thousand per quarter times four. <laughs> Kilberg says eight hundred sixty thousand dollars, but I'm not holding him to it. Without the percentage increase. Yeah. Right. I will say, too, that the lease payments, the revenue from the lease payments, are split between the general fund and the water wastewater fund. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Anyone else? Alderman Kilberg. Uh, point of information. Uh, how many uh, such contracts are in place on the, uh, the uh, Burgess Field Water Tower at the current time? Uh, what, are there three or four? Uh, currently at the Dodson Street Water Tower, we have two. 
Uh, Verizon is also there along with T-Mobile. And at the Logan Street Tower, we have AT&T, T-Mobile, and Sprint. We used to have U.S. Cellular, but a few years back they uh, took their antennas down. And all of these contracts, as far as the compensation piece, is comparable? or uh... um, Some are comparable. Others, uh, because they added on, let's say, a shelter, uh, onto the site are are more okay so okay thank you mm -hmm. anyone else from the dais mr clerk take the roll please ruby aye caven aye kilberg aye Aladra. aye marks aye mcgowan aye swanson aye bruno aye burkhardt Clements. Aye. Item 3E passes unanimously, folks, with 10 affirmative votes, zero nay votes, and zero absent. Item 3F is to consider draft resolution number 2019-64, authorizing a waiver of bidding process and purchase of ISCO flow meters from Gazvoda and Associates in an amount not to exceed 44000 one hundred and nine dollars. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion by Alderman Bruno. Second. Seconded by Alderman Ruby. Ms. Dawkins. Okay. So uh, for this fiscal year, we allocated sixty-four thousand in the budget for the purchase of sanitary sewer flow meters. Uh, the meters will obtain flow data that will be used during a multi-year sanitary sewer evaluation study and any future studies. The data will identify areas for further investigation and/or improvements to the system. Staff obtained two quotes and is recommending a purchase from Gazvodi and Associates in an amount not to exceed $44,109. Again, Superintendent Van Geskum is here to answer any questions you might have. Let's just clarify. Is it Gazvoda or Gazvodi? Gazvoda. Kidoki. <laughs> that was a tough one. Any questions or comments for the Superintendent and or for Ms. Dawkins? Alderman Burkert. Mr. Clerk, please take the roll. You're all waiting, right? Yes. Caven. Aye. Kilberg. Aye. Malaja. Aye. Marks. Aye. McGowan. Aye. Swanson. Aye. Bruno. Aye. Burkhardt. Burkhardt, aye. Clements. Aye. Ruby. Aye. Item 3F passes unanimously with 10 affirmative votes, zero nay votes, and zero absent. Item 3G, consider draft resolution number 2019-65 authorizing execution of a change order, number nine, for the waste water treatment plant improvements with IHC construction, increasing the total contract amount from $10,617,578 to $10,661,510.82. Is there a motion? So motion by Alderman McGowan. Second. Seconded by Alderman Bruce. Now crowned Mr. Enthusiasm throughout the evening. So in your packet this evening was a memo summarizing the proposed change order requests uh, that have been submitted. Um, I would try to go through those, but I don't know what half of that is, to be honest. So they have been grouped together in change order number nine. The net change is an increase of $43,932.82. These change orders are loan eligible and will be funded under the IEPA SRF loan. Uh, mm -hmm. Superintendent Magescom is present because he does know what all of those things mean. So if you have any questions, I would recommend you ask him. Based on that comment, Superintendent Van Geskum. I believe Alderman Kilberg was first to light up, seconded by Alderman Marks. Um, my question is simply uh, the completion of the project. Are we still looking at a fall completion? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're uh, right now we're uh, really kind of wrapping things up. They've already started the, the punch list uh, mm -hmm. of items uh, that are outstanding right now that need to be, you know, kind of buttered up and cleaned up and but yes, we're, we're looking at um, hopefully it, by the end of July being substantially completed and so final completion. Sounds like they're ahead of schedule. Yes. Okay, thank you. Question. We got it. This is two in a row for you, man. It's like, anyone, anyone else on the dais? Questions for Superintendent Van Geskum? Alderman Burkhart? No, thank you. I'm good. Thank you. 
What do you think, Mr. Clerk? I'm ready. Take the roll. Are they ready? Are they <laughs> Swanson. Aye. McGowan. Aye. Marks. Aye. Maladra. Aye. Kilberg. Aye. Cabin. Aye. Ruby. Aye. Clements. Aye. Burkhart. Burkhart, aye. Bruno. Aye. Motion passes with 10 affirmative votes, zero nay votes, and zero absent. We're a new business, folks. Besides Ms. Dawkins, anyone from the dais, any new business? Anyone in the audience? Anybody, anybody. Hello. Ms. Dawkins. Okay, so uh, a question came up on the break, and I just wanted to assure everyone that the charrette planning process next week has been noticed as a public meeting. What the notice says is that, please be advised that a majority of a quorum of members of the following boards and commissions may be present at any and or all of the above listed sessions, and I listed the three, the Monday, the Wednesday, the Thursday sessions, the City Council, the Plan Commission, the Historic Preservation Committee, uh, Commission, the Strategic Plan Advisory Committee, um, no formal action will be taken at any of the above listed board or commissions during these community sessions. So what that means is that you are all able to attend any and all of those sessions without fear of violating the Open Meetings Act. So we have no meeting on Monday, so my hope is that you will all attend any and all of those sessions. Thank you. Anyone else? Shall we test the council? Since I've completely screwed things up tonight, Mr. City Attorney, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion by Alderman Marks. All in favor of adjourning, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Good night, folks. Thank you, Tara, very much. All right.